Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you as we gather together today to observe Christ's sacrifice, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. For in the words of the Messiah, If ye love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another Comforter, that he may abide with you for ever. Even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him, but ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world seeth me no more, but ye see me, because I live, ye shall live also. At that day ye shall know that I am in my Father, and ye in me, and I in you. He that hath my commandments, and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, and will manifest myself to him. Amen. This sermon is dealing with Nisan 14, Abib 14, the first month of the Lord's calendar, the name that he gave it. In dealing with a topic that is probably the most important to humanity, the first important step of humanity, because, of course, the sacrifice of Christ is the starting point of salvation. Starting point. Because, of course, there are many people who, we don't know the number, but we know there is a lake of fire coming, and there are going to be people burning in it, or burnt in it, not burning forever, but burnt in it, despite the fact that Christ died to save people from that fire. So right away, what does that sort of tell us? Just right away. Is it because, are they going to burn because they never heard the name of Jesus? Should we spend millions of dollars and send our young people all around the world just so people, they can just let people know the name of Jesus? And you know that's what, for all intents and purposes, some churches do. So if they can just say they call upon the name of Jesus, then they can say they're saved. Wouldn't it be nice if it was that easy, really? But it's not. You're going to have to live a life beyond that because that in itself is what Passover is about. The second part of Passover, which was and is and always will be about repentance. It matters how we behave. It matters how we choose to behave. How once we are able to respond to the means to do what is right, truly right, because, you know, Satan, I, I, I don't claim to understand Satan's mind, and I surely wouldn't want to. But I'm a human. I can understand my own mind, and I can understand the influence that Satan has had upon the human mind. Because right now, the, the mind of humanity is satanic. We were not created in the way that we are. And even when we repent, we're still subject to it. I, I compared it to swimming around in a fish tank. You can swim away from the mucky parts. You can swim away from the bottom up toward the light, but you're still in the tank. And you're going to remain in the tank as long as you're physically alive. But humans weren't created as sinners. They didn't have the attitude that we have now, regardless of how hard we try to overcome. But that in itself is what overcoming is about. If we were free of it, we wouldn't be overcoming. We wouldn't be repenting. We wouldn't living, be living our lives in the manner in which Christ requires us to live. And it gets easier while it gets harder. Easier in the sense that the target gets so much easier to see, so much clearer. That no matter what else happens, good, bad, or otherwise, you're not going to be moved from off that direction that the Lord has pointed you and which you have accepted the offer to travel for the destination that's coming, which is your eternal life. And if you're called now, prior to the time of Christ's return, your salvation day, when you will be saved, is on the day of Christ's return. But we have to make the journey. We just can't say, I'm a Christian and I'm going to do as I please and Christ is just going to do everything I want He's got that salvation, that eternal life. So we kind of want that, but we don't really want to do anything. Oh, 
better not use the word earn it. We're not earning it. But we are being worthy of a free gift. Gifts are given for a reason. When was the last time you gave a gift to someone for no reason at all? Or gave a gift to someone because they did something evil to you? Or fought you in every possible way that they could? Is that is that the reason for giving a free gift? No strings attached? Is that the reason? Of course not. There's a reason. And when we begin that journey, we understand that it's a free journey. We're free. We can do whatever we want. But not if we want to get to salvation. We can go a whole lot of other different directions. We can go down every every back road, every side alley, every place that's going to go for absolutely nowhere. Literally a dead end. And that's what salvation is about. But Christ came along to save us from that. That fate that we're headed for if we don't do something about it. And unless we do do something about it, we're not going to be saved, even though we could have been. People misunderstand that point. They think well, because they don't understand that there are two resurrections, two, two times of calling, two Passovers offers. Because the offer is given to those to whom it is given. The rest it will be given later. The Passover sacrifice applies to us now. The Passover offer applies to us now because we're able to do something about it. But for most of the Christian professing world, they don't. The offer has not been made to them yet. That will come later. That's what the another true Christian holy day is all about, the eighth day. Put the link on for that. They're all connected, just as the Day of Atonement is connected to Passover. One is the sacrifice, the other is the deliver, delivery of the payment for the gift. It's like when you go, you continue the analogy, you know, when someone gives a gift, they don't steal the gift, do they? They go and they buy it in order to give it freely to someone else. Well, Christ bought the gift of salvation he's giving us. He bought it with his own blood. And that payment, among other things, was delivered on the Day of Atonement, the delivery of that sacrifice payment. Just making it, well, you know, it's like going into a store, you could have the money to buy something, and you pick it up and you walk out with the money still in your pocket and say, well, I got the money to pay for it, but you have to pay for it. You may have it. As long as you still have it, you haven't paid for it. Christ is the one that's worked as a matter of providing the means necessary to purchase the gift that he gives to those, everyone who wants to receive it, you know, he holds out his hands, but if you just stand there with your arms crossed or turn your back on him or run from him or put your hands over your ears and over your eyes, we hear that every day, constantly, from people who just haven't had their calling yet. And tragically, sometimes, from those who have. And that's shocking, in a way, because they become... I won't use the word brainwashed, but convinced that a particular system that only existed for the past, not even a century, it is the church, as though it's always been that way, and it's not. Read what the church, quote-unquote, the people were, how they conducted themselves in the time in which the New Testament was being written, that record. Or a little history of since that time. They've never existed in the corporate manner in which they do now, or with ministers behaving in a way that Christ commanded them not to behave. Don't do that. If you're looking to be the leading minister, well, you've got a bad attitude, because Christ is the leading minister in his church. We are his servants. The leading servant is the one who is most in service to Christ and his people by doing what he says, not building a little kingdom for oneself. Yes, that's what the Pharisees did. That's what the people who rejected Christ did. They walked around in their flowing robes and had people call them master or mister, same word in English. The Messiah said, don't do that. It's wrong. 
What's the hard part about don't do that in understanding what he said? Don't do that. What's the hard part? Well, the human ego. That mind of Satan that we still have and are subject to if we let it. The Lord made the sacrifice of himself as an offer to those who want to be saved. Because the second part of it, the days of Passover or the days of unleavened bread, as they are the term, many argument, arguments about that, the terminology, even within the Church of God, there are some people who will observe it on this sound 14, some will observe it on the 15th, some will observe it on both. The reasoning there, basically the reasoning there, the 14th is because when Christ is when Christ observed the Last Supper, so-called, which he had to do because he would have been dead, it was dead the next night. He was in the, the first night of those three days and three nights in his tomb on the 15th, which is when he observed it all his life. That was Passover. The 14th is not Passover. The 14th is the 14th. Even though it is called the first day of Passover or the preparation of Passover or the first day of unleavened bread or the preparation for the days of unleavened bread and all the, the terminology that is used. And within the church, traditionally now, based on a, a verse in the Bible, the Passover, first day of Passover, or first day of unleavened bread, is known as the, the night to be much observed, as in keeping with the Lord's command to commemorate the night that the Israelites observed the first Passover and the death of the firstborn and the plagues that night, and they were saved by it, those who obeyed the command of that blood. So it was a matter of the terminology. Let's, let's be really bold and say it's the Bible's fault because of the confusion, because of the different terminology. Days of Passover, days of unleavened bread. Are there seven? Are there eight? On the 14th, on the 15th. Is it the Bible's fault? Well, I'm, of course, I'm being silly there. There's nothing wrong with the Bible, but there is a lot of wrong with the, the way in, in which people interpret, as a matter of the renderings of the original verses, some of which were written in a way that everybody knew what, the, what they were talking about at that time. The days of Passover, days of unleavened bread, everybody knew what they meant by it. Whereas, particularly for those of us who grew up in other religious organizations that called themselves Christian but really weren't, as we found out, it's new to us. So we assume that, therefore, there is the Passover and there is the days of unleavened bread, and that's somehow different. But as far as salvation goes, they're an entire package. Christ's offer of his blood must be accepted. Can we say that in a single sentence? I guess we just did, didn't we? And that's Passover and the days of unleavened, putting sin out of your life as a matter of repenting and just doing what the Lord says. It is simple. I know that the arguments this time of year around the holy days, and there's we now have a complete set of arguments for every single one of the holy days. When they should be observed, how they should be observed, and on and on it goes, and we've covered all that. We, we've done a set of sermons and studies on that now, and we'll put the links on for those if you want, if you're interested, because you're going to encounter if you who will argue. And have you noticed in this world that no matter what you do, no matter what you do, there's going to be somebody or a whole lot of people arguing about it. It's just the way it is, and you can waste your life, waste your time arguing with them. I'm not saying don't listen. That's very important. Listening is very important because that's how you learn stuff. We want to learn stuff. But once you've heard them, once the, the record, once it starts to loop around and around, it becomes a contest of conquering the other person, taking charge of the other person's religion. Well, then the conversation has served its purpose. You've listened to them. Fine. You take it in. You just sort of use that information as a part of what you're learning from the Bible. Not meaning it's replacing the Bible, but in helping you to understand it. Because even the translations themselves, you know, it's very important, I think, to read Bible translations. Uh, I often hear from people who make a suggestion of, uh, actually, I have one here, that I should read the complete Jewish Bible, a translation by David H. Stern. And actually, I have, and I, I got one right here. I'm holding it. I just picked it up. Not because it's better than the others, but because it adds perspective, particularly the names, place names, some of the other things, even the, the book names. It, it's useful. It gives us a wider understanding. 
It doesn't replace anything. I wouldn't make it my only Bible reading Bible. This is I wouldn't make any Bible my own reading Bible. I've grown more and more fond of the King James since, since I started using it entirely for daily Bible study now. Even though the RSV is still my my own direct personal reading Bible, I, I've come, grown fond of the King James. It's the English doesn't seem as archaic now after I've used it for a long time. But it is just a matter of reading, and that's what we're going to do today. Just read it. Just read what happened on this Psalm 14. In the old, back in the old time, the old days back there, way back there in the Old Testament. And a lot of Christian professing people think that doesn't matter. But it does, because Christ matters, and he was the Lord God. I try to hammer that point home as every opportunity I get, because it's a key to understanding the Bible. Most of the so-called Old Testament hasn't happened yet, as a matter of the prophecies. Most of the prophecies of the Old Testament haven't happened yet. At least not in ultimateness, ultimate fulfillmentness. They haven't. So how can it be old and archaic and done away if it hasn't even happened yet? It's still in the future. And God's law, you know, observing God's law, that, that's never going to be done away with. The only thing that's going to be done away about God's law are those who refuse to obey it. They're going to be done away. But that, again, comes brings us back to Passover. Not accepting the sacrifice of the Messiah, of the Lord God, of the Lamb of God, by repenting. That's what we have to do. He's already done his part. But you know, even then, it's a multiple layer thing because there are two resurrections coming. The first on the day of Christ's return, people who've understood the truth, who've been abled, enabled to understand the truth by means of the Holy Spirit because you can't do it otherwise. You just can't. It's impossible. And who have taken the opportunity given to them to accept the sacrifice of the Messiah by repenting, by struggling through this veil of tears called life that can be so joyous and, and yet it's also at the same time be absolutely miserable. Sometimes the worst thing you can do on any given day is to think. Really. But then, thinking's okay too because we can think of all the wonderful things in this creation that are awaiting to be shed of all the muck that presently is burying them, and oftentimes burying the people who look beyond this world as it is now. But it's a two-part thing. And those people, which includes us, if, you, if your opportunity is now, we're in the same category as all the people throughout history who repented. They will be resurrected or changed to spirit, if alive that day, to spirit, to meet the Lord in the air. That's the first resurrection, that's salvation. That's Passover fulfilled for them. But what about the people who haven't been, had their calling yet? Has Passover been observed for them? Well, it's the offer is there. It's sort of there. But it's not being held out to them yet because they have no means of doing much about it yet. Not without the Holy Spirit. In, in its place they will observe Easter. Well-meaning, well-meaning people they think that, well, the Old Testament's done away, or, or actually that we just put the, a recent study this week about that Good Friday idea. Christ was not crucified on a Friday. According to the Bible, or in the man it was, but they ignore the reality or just simply were never aware of it. There, there were two preparation days that way, week. The first for the Passover is on 14, which is, is what it is. It's a preparation day, really. Because the Passover lamb was killed on that day for the Passover to begin on the 15th, which is when Christ would have observed it, or did observe it all his life. And he observed it that year as well, but he did it dead in his tomb after being the Passover lamb himself. Well, he was there at Passover, wasn't he? He's very much a part of it. The lambs were uh, much more humanely killed than the Messiah was, though. They didn't, the Levites, they didn't torture a lamb, beat it, whip it, spit it in its face, put a crown of thorns on its head, beat it, blindfold it, and, and beat it. Tie up a man and take ten heroes to beat on him. They didn't have enough guts to face him one on one. Not that he would have done anything then anyway, but, you know, there's a time coming when they're all going to face him. Because he was a king. 
he, when he comes back, he's not going to be wearing a crown of thorns. He's going to be wearing a crown. But those people then, even then, are going to get their opportunity. And among them will be people who took their opportunity within even the Pharisees, the people who condemned him. Nicodemus, very famous. People will quote John 3.16 over and over and over, ignoring the very fact that it's talking about Passover. You're not born again now, as Jesus plainly said, even though millions of people say they are. Or that all they have to do is claim Jesus' name and they're saved. Well, no, you're not. Not according to Jesus. That's pretty important. I mean, if, if he says that's the way it is, then that's the way it is. But those people will get their opportunity as well. Among them, Apostle Paul, he was there sneering, taking part in the killing of the Messiah. I, I'm absolutely sure he was a, a participant. The Bible doesn't record it because I, I really think it would be such a distraction. We all knew by his own words that he was there participating in the killing of Stephen. He went all over the place, uh, uh, far up into foreign countries even, to get people there. It would be a distraction to know that he was actually there spitting on the Messiah. But I think he was. Along with the rest of them, he was a Jerusalem Pharisee. How could he not be? How could a, a ripe young gunner like that miss out on all the fun? And the frenzy. We'll put the link on for that. And how they all knew. And yet they were all innocent till the Holy Spirit enabled them. Because otherwise, you know, if he was that evil, then why would we include the others in that? And why didn't the Lord just kill him? Or why didn't he just leave him to live out his miserable life? And then he will face the resurrection of judgment later on, which he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. He knew better. But he didn't. He was made into a great Christian. He was forgiven because he accepted the very sacrifice that, ironically, he took part in spilling the blood of. He was sort of like a Levite killing a lamb. But as we said, lambs were never brutalized like that. They were humanely killed. And they did it with respect and with love, because they understood the purpose. That it was in that lamb that they were killing themselves, putting away their old self. Not quite like a suicide, because suicide is to end a life, but that sort of sacrifice is to end what is a wrong life and begin a new one. But it's not there yet until such time that things are done. And even the observance today, the people of Judah observe the days of Passover, but they don't observe them in a way that we do. As we call them, we emphasize the term days of unleavened bread, which they are, because we emphasize the repentance. That's the reason. I, I'm, it's the only reason why we don't just keep calling it Passover, even though that's what it is. But the reason we observe it, the night to be much observed, well, we had to call it something, didn't we? I mean, we as the church, we tend to call the 14th the Passover because Christ observed that Last Supper at that time, but it was the preparation. The next day he died at the same time as the Passover lambs. And why not? He was the Passover. He was the one that instituted it. So it is a night to be much observed. We'll cover that in our next sermon, because the two do go together. But the reality is that we observe it differently. It is correct for us to call it the days of unleavened bread. But they are days of Passover, because Passover is a single package. That's an important point. I know I repeat it, but it helps to repeat it. Important things need to be repeated because if you say them more than once or twice or three times, it helps for people to reinforce a particular point along with it. And that's the reason I do it, if you notice. Well, I, there's method in there somewhere. But we do it because we want to repent. They do it because they're observing Passover. To them, it's a day of holiness. It's not a profane day or a common day, but they do it with a different purpose, different reasoning different a lot of things for now but they'll come around and we know they're not doing it entirely wrong a lot of things have been added since that time they're observing it as Christ did at that time you have to remember that much of what became Judaism at that time already existed it's continued to the present day a lot of it has been added but Christ observed it the right parts of it 
know, he was an observant Jew. He observed Passover on the 15th. He observed, observed the days of Passover. Exactly the same as Jews do now. He observed the holy days. We know that. He went to Sabbath services. Every, he spoke. He did readings at the, in the synagogue on the Sabbath. He observed Passover on the 15th all his life, except for the last one, because, well, he observed it then as well, of course, but as we said, he was dead. It's not hard. It's very easy. So let's just read it. What he did. And I don't mean just in the New Testament. I mean what he did, what he told the others to do as a prefigure of what was coming, because if you understand that part, you can understand the latter part, and how the preparation day of the 14th that Christ was preparing himself for his sacrifice when they were preparing the lamb to put them all even the, the gathering of the lamb on the tent well he, he he arrived in Jerusalem at that time he was there he, he went back to Bethany at night but he was there he, at the same time the lambs were being gathered held we'll read that it was a preparation day he was preparing himself for the sacrifice when they went out to the Mount of Olives, just before he was arrested, he prayed. Read what he, you know, read what he prayed. And we will, as a preparation for what he was about to do. Preparation, preparation, preparation. The next day, and on the 14th, the lambs were slaughtered, and the Lamb of God was slaughtered. It's very easy. It really is, if you just get away from the complications that people want to add. And one of the biggest complications, the one, the one thing that blocks the light is someone who's just got to be right. For whatever reason, I mean, part of that's human nature. We don't like to think we're wrong, but the thing is, that can be taken to such an extreme that even later on, if you don't cut yourself a little bit of slack, as in being humble enough to realize, you know, we make mistakes, and if, but if you have a problem with, with some sort of a contest that you're living, that you have to be right, you have to be the leader, well then w when you find out later on you've made a mistake, you can't admit it. And then you're in the danger zone, because then you know. We're not being judged for the, the things that we're wrong about because we just don't know any better. We're judged for the wrong we do deliberately afterwards. You know, Paul was forgiven. He was a killer. A Christian hater, Christian killer. But he was forgiven because he got up off his face. You know, the Lord could have knocked him down dead, but he just instead knocked him down onto his face into the dirt. Whether that was the scales on his eyes, I've often wondered about that, whether it was really physical scales or it was just a lot of grit from the dirt, from his face being rammed into the stand that hard. It took him that long to get all the dirt and muck out of his eyes. Very gritty, very painful. It could have been something like that. The Lord just sort of picked him up and rammed him head first into the ground. But when he could see physically, he was also baptized. He was given the means to see physically, physically by means of the Holy Spirit, spiritually. Because physically, he lived his life thereafter. He didn't just walk around saying, I'm saved. Praise Jesus. I mean, there's nothing wrong with saying praise Jesus. But there's a lot wrong with saying you're being saved. Because it does not accept Christ's sacrifice by saying that. You're not saved until you are, and we're not done our journey yet. Our days of unleavened bread, the days of putting sin out of our lives, are all of our lives of overcoming sin. We're not done yet. It could go on a long time, whether long time or short. That's what we have to do to overcome. And saying you're done the journey when you're on the journey doesn't make sense, does it? really doesn't. And as I said, I'll put on the links for the other sermons we've done um, in how to observe Passover and the date controversies and so on. But a lot of it, as we'll just do here, just sort of, we've been doing a Bible reading, and we'll just sort of do that with Passover here. For Nisan 14, just to let the Bible say what it says. And... People can say what they want after that, but the thing is, if you read what's in the Bible, a lot of the answers are there for you. And how to, even just how to observe Christian Passover, the Christian preparation day for Passover. It's 
I, I've sort of come to think of it that way. I, I wouldn't change the name of it. But really, that's what it is. The Last Supper was really a preparation for what was coming. Christ was preparing himself. He was preparing his followers. Then and ever since, the prayer they made for him, the instructions they gave to them, the understanding that he gave to them, that they would remember later when the Holy Spirit came. It's all there. So let's have a read of it. About Nisan 14. But first, a little bit of background, briefly, or foreground, if you will, because this is what came before. He is what came before. And again, I emphasize the point, you've got to understand who the Lord God is in order to understand the Word of God. And even that, to understand who the Word of God is, because it will put the link on for those two studies. And what does Word of God mean to you? Does it mean the Bible? Well, yes, it could. But who was speaking? Who was the Lord God? Who was sent? And we'll answer that, and it was Christ. He was the one that was born as the Christ, the Messiah. It wasn't his last name. His name wasn't Jesus Christ. It was Christ as a, as a title. The Anointed One. The Messiah in the different languages, whether it's from the Greek or from the Hebrew. But here's regardless of what language. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 to 17, just to understand who it was we're talking about in that so-called Old Testament back there who told these people what to do. And even then, both parts were there. 1 Corinthians 10, 117, Moreover, brethren, I would not that ye should be ignorant that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Stop. Baptized is a pretty Christian word, isn't it? Most people think of it that way. Continuing, And did all eat the same spiritual meat and did all drink the same spiritual drink for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and that rock was Christ and to interject, indeed it was, right from the very beginning. We put on the, all those studies. Verse 5, But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things were our examples, to the intent that we should not lust after evil things, as they also lusted. Neither be ye idolaters, as were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and rose up to play. Neither let us commit fornication of some, as some of them committed, and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. Stop. Who was doing that? Who, who dropped them all? All those people? It was Christ, as we'll read. Verse 9. Neither let us tempt Christ, as some of them also tempted, and were destroyed of serpent. Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. Now, all these things happened unto them for our ensamples, and they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore, let him that thinketh he standeth take heed, lest he fall. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. And to interject there, that's true. You grow. You grow with knowledge, but you also grow not weaker, not not less able to stand against the, the wiles of the devil. We get smarter as we go along. We understand the world much better. We remain sheep, but we're, we're smart. We're, we're understanding how the things work. You know, get us once. Fine. We made our mistake. We learned our lesson, but Next time will be a different story. And we, we get not hardened, but able to bend without being broken. And that's the important thing. Very important. We grow stronger, but in love and in understanding and in compassion. We don't become hard like the world and just heartless like the world. Verse 14, Wherefore, my dearly beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak to wise men, Judge ye what I say. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? For we being many are one bread and one body. We are all partakers of that one bread. And the word communion there, if, uh, I, was, I was a former Catholic. I still have a problem with that word, even though I know now what it really means, what it was really meant by there. But it's like a, one of those yipe, 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 run and hide words. 
you just it's like Mary, it took me a long time to even be able to write a Bible study about Mary without having totally rejected, just totally done to her, abused her in the way that the Christian world has done. And I think a lot of the Protestant world have abused her as much as the Catholic world have because they ignore her or they just don't say anything at all about her. And she deserves better than that. She doesn't deserve to be worshipped. She's going to be horrified when she is resurrected if, if that sort of emotion is still there. We know she's going to be in the kingdom of God. But she's going to be absolutely unhappy with how she's been viewed in history, whether from the Catholics who've, who've called her practically higher than God. They deny it, but I was a Catholic. I know what they think about Mary. Or at the same time, almost ignored and, and disrespected because of the way the Catholics have treated her. No one is really giving her a fair shake. And I, I, I can understand that. It took a while. You can look for daily Bible study. You won't hardly find any any studies about Mary. But that's the reason. It, it, we, we just are given this brainwashing job, and it takes a while to overcome the scars, even when we know better. And that applies to whatever religious background we have. And the word communion, well, there, they, there we go again. But it's not what they meant by it. And all the things that have been messed up and abused, that's not our problem, is it? We understand that. But the point of what this is saying here, it was Christ right from the very beginning. And the very purpose of what we're talking about here, the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? You can see how he didn't just sort of take two subjects and sort of stitch them together. He's talking about the same thing. He began talking about that so-called God of the Old Testament who brought forth the Passover and the Exodus and everything, and he's talking about the communion of the blood of Christ through the lessons that were there. Our examples. You can see the connection. There isn't this break that somehow you have to sort of weld together, just to weld the other half of the Bible there. It's sort of there. It comes with the Bible. You go into the store and you got to buy it. Although there have been attempts to sell New Testament, even though they're leaving out half the Bible and doing so because it was Christ. Is her point. So it's the reason we're reading what we're reading. It's Christian. That's the bottom line. It's Christian. It always has been. Because it's always been Christ. He didn't come along to, to begin a rebellion against God or say, well, the God of the Old Testament, well, we're going we're gonna to get rid of all that. That's what Satan tried to do with his rebellion. Christ was the God of the Old Testament, the Lord God who was sent by the Father to do all of the work to prepare the way for God's coming. And he is. The Bible ends with God, with God's coming to earth. That's what kingdom of God means. That's what it's all about. It doesn't end, and it's not completed when Christ returns. He will begin, then, to install the kingdom of God on earth for God's coming a thousand years later, a little over a thousand years later. You put the link on for the throne of God. So you can see how it all fits. And these points, we can't leave them out if you're going to understand what Passover was about and why there's a need to accept that offer of salvation by repentance. Because when God gets here, Christ's job will have been completed in that all that oppose God, not as in all who choose not to be children of God, born that way. We don't have the choice. We don't have the power to make ourselves eternal life. We have right now our physical life. Even then, we didn't have much of a choice in the matter, or any choice at all. But with our eternal life, we do have a choice. And that comes through repentance, the acceptance of the offer of eternal life that Christ is offering to us by means of his sacrifice. Do you see it all just goes around? It doesn't matter what part of the circle you start in. It's the singularity of that circle. It's everything. There isn't one one part here and one part over there. And one part. No, no. You don't have to try to put it all together. It is together already. Christ put it together. Because the Father sent him to. And so he did. Exodus 12, 1 to 30. And the Son 14. But notice... Notice, we can't just sort of find a stop point. Here's where Nisan, the point of Nisan 14 stops, and then the next day, the Days of Unleavened Bread. There's there's like Passover, screeching stop, 
and then fast start again into the week of the Days of Unleavened Bread. It doesn't work that way. It's called the Days of Passover and so on. But again, as we mentioned, the people who are yet unconverted but who observe the days, ironically, call them the Days of Passover, even though they didn't yet, most of them, accept the Messiah when he came, and so therefore they can't very well accept his sacrifice. But what they did was also vital, or else, you know, if they would have accepted him, they would, if they'd have been all like Peter, you know, Peter, he drew a sword, he was going to defend the Messiah from being killed. And if everybody in Judah had done the same thing, we'd still be without a savior. He had to be sacrificed. He had to be where he was. Eat Satan, <laughs> he's so smart, but he's so foolish. Because his second biggest mistake was allowing, or at least not trying to stop, the sacrifice of the Messiah. His biggest mistake, of course, was his original rebellion. But Christ's sacrifice was what the, the temptation of Christ was about Satan attempting to get the Messiah to sin. When he told him, when Satan told the Messiah, as you stand there quoting scripture to him, that all the world is mine, you can have it if you just bow down before me. He wasn't a liar. The Messiah didn't say, no, no, you're, you're a liar. You don't have that to give to me. He had it. But that changed when the Messiah overcame, overcame Satan and was sacrificed as a payment for the damage that Satan has done. Instead of getting Judas to betray the Christ, he went right into him, possessed apparently directly by him. He should have been doing everything that he possibly could to prevent to prevent that sacrifice, because it was the sacrifice that has now put an end to Satan's kingdom, Satan's rule. It's just a matter now of time. His days are up. The Lord is simply letting him, according to the Lord's own time, remain the few extra centuries, which, you know, to the Lord isn't anything. But for Satan, it's over. He's lost his grip now. He's just allowed to run around for a little while. But the sacrifice was something that Satan should have been doing everything he could to stop. But he helped it along. And everyone else, as we mentioned in our recovery in our recent study this week, probably the only trial in the history of humanity in which virtually everybody knew, from the accusers to the the people who set him up, to the false accusers, the liars that they brought in to testify against him, to the judge, to the military, to the police. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew he was innocent. They killed him anyway. And on top of that, they let a murderer go free. Barabbas. Exodus 12, 1-30. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron, in the land of Egypt, saying, and to interject there, the Lord God was Christ, as we just read, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for an house. And if the household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next unto his house, take it according to the number of the souls. Every man according to his eating shall be, shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall take it out from the sheep or from the goats. Stop. Interesting point, isn't it? Sheep or the goats. He's going to, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, but notice, goats can become sheep. Goats can become sheep, and sheep can become goats. It doesn't matter what they do or refuse to do thereafter. With the link on for sheep and goats. Verse 6, And you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, and the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And to interject there, that keeping in mind there was no Levitical priesthood yet. There was a line in the Ten Commandments movie in which Aaron, when he was first introducing himself to his long-lost brother Moses, he made a reference to the priesthood that's an inaccuracy. There was no priesthood at that time. We'll put the link on for the origin of the Levitical priesthood. Verse 7, And they shall take of the blood and strike 
it on the two side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it, and they shall eat the flesh in that night, roast with fire and unleavened bread, and with bitter herbs they shall eat it. Eat not of it raw nor sodden at all with water, but roast with fire his head with his legs and with the perturance thereof, and you shall let nothing of it remain until the morning, and that which remaineth of it until the morning you shall burn with fire. And thus shall ye eat it, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both, both man and beast. Against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be and to interject the why, why the beasts? Why the animals? Well, because a lot of them were worshipped. Whether they're cow, whether they're eagles or they're birds they were worshipping, whatever. The point was made in all that of their idolatry. Verse 13, And the blood shall be to you for a token upon the houses where ye are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. And this day shall be unto you for a memorial, and you shall keep it a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your house, houses. For whosoever eateth leavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that soul shall be cut off from Israel. And to interject, and to interject there, the reason you can't make a disconnect is because the first day of unleavened bread was also the day in which the Passover occurred. It was that night, as the church has traditionally come to call it, based on the line in the Bible, a night to be much observed. But that was the day after the preparation of the 14th, when Christ observed it, he was the, the Lamb. But you can see there why, in its original form, as it was given, there, is, there can be no disconnect because the first day of Passover, or the day in which the Passover sacrifice and that event, the death of the firstborn happened, was on the night of the first day of unleavened bread, or the first day of Passover. And you can see why it's called that, as we just read. It, the Passover occurred at a time when they were putting out the sin out of their lives, as in putting out the disobedience, and those who didn't obey what the Lord said to do didn't survive at all. So even then, it was a matter of obedience. And it's all it was. It wasn't just some ritual, pointless ritual. Even then, it was a matter of obedience, because those who didn't obey it, they were dead. Very simple. And in the verse 16, and the first day there shall be an holy convocation, and in the seventh day there shall be an holy convocation to you. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that which every man must eat, that only may be done of you. And stop there. Why are the first and seventh days holy? What is significant about them? What makes them special? Well, the, fir you, the first, the most obvious answer is that the first day represents represents the day in which you accept Christ's sacrifice by living according to what he says to do. So it was the day of a beginning of a new life, of a journey. And for them it was an exodus coming out of the world. You see the Christian parts of that. And the seventh day, well, that's the end of your life. That's graduation day. That's the day of your salvation. So it's pretty special too. But in between is not just seven days. That however many days it, it comes down to, every, however many days there were from the time you began your Christian life, truly repenting, and the last day of your life. That's the seventh day of the unleavened bread. That's the meaning of it, the ultimate meaning of it. But again, the significance of the observation, of the observance, of the purpose. But again, it, it, it doesn't require interpretation. You just read it. All you have to do is read it. But those who didn't obey him, those who did not accept his offer of salvation, died if they didn't obey him. He didn't just say, I'm going to go over, pass over Egypt and kill all the firstborn of those other folks over there. He said everybody. It applied to everybody. And the gospel applies to everyone.
Same thing. Verse 17, you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in this selfsame day have I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether it be a stranger or born in the land. So again, was there any obedience there? Those who ignored the significance of that? Because even putting out the leaven, even that was more about obedience to the Lord. It could have been anything. As it happens, the object lesson was with leaven because the puffing up, the arrogance, the lack of humility in, in that one can do as they please and expect God to just sort of sort of follow along behind, but it could have been anything. It was about obedience. Those who didn't put the leaven on their lives, it wasn't the leaven that killed them. It was the Lord for defying him, for making themselves an enemy of him. Verse 20, You shall eat nothing leavened. In all your habitations shall ye eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. And you shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. And to interject there, what happens if they disobey? They're dead. Do you see salvation, the obedience part, repentance, obeying God? Do you suppose, is there any doubt at all that there were those who disobeyed? Is there any doubt at all? And is there any doubt at all what happened to them? Verse 23, And the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when ye come to the land which the Lord will give you, according as he hath promised, that ye shall keep this service. And again, arrival of the promised land. Are, are these holy days going to be observed in the kingdom of God? Well, we know the Passover is. The Lord said that, that he will not drink of the fruit of the vine until... His kingdom comes, so it, it's still going to be observed, plainly, we know that, because not as a prophecy, not as a manner of looking forward and hope towards something, but as a manner of celebrating and commemorating an achievement. It's like a national holiday, and well, the kingdom of God will have its national holidays as well. Number them. Verse 26, And it shall come to pass, when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? Then you shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover, who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses. And the people bowed the head and worshipped. And the children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. So did they. And it came to pass that at midnight the Lord smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh that sat on his throne under the firstborn of the captive that was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of cattle. And the Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants, and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. So it was about a sacrifice, but it wasn't just the sacrifice. You can see very plainly it was a matter also of obedience in order for the sacrifice to work. Those who did not obey didn't have the sacrifice of that blood apply to them. And it's no different. As we read from First Corinthians, their examples were for us, for our lives, for our purpose, for our Passover, for our being as Christians. You don't walk around and say, I believe in Jesus, but I go to church on Sunday and do as I please. It doesn't work that way. Or walking around saying you're saved, well, you can't arrive at the destination while well, you're still on the journey. And if you're saying that, you haven't even begun the journey yet because you're not saved. Just knowing that. Knowing that you've got to walk the walk. Not just misuse Christ's name for your own purpose. Saying, well, he's got something pretty good there, like salvation. So let's just take it on our own terms. And there are a lot of people who behave in the way in this world 
who actually behave as though they think that's going to happen. And it's not. Not ever. The sacrifice of salvation is for the repentant. And also the question of, the, it comes in consistently, how do I observe Passover, Christian Passover? And the only answer I could provide to that is to read the Bible. Read what Christ did uh, as an example of what we should be doing. And actually, if you want to continue what he did as a matter of all of it, um, and we'll read it here from Matthew, and then we'll go to John's account is longer. Uh, he includes the prayer. We won't be able to read it all. We don't have enough time, but I'll put on the verse numbers for that. But if you want to know how to observe the preparation for Passover, and it's very difficult for me now, and even we'll read it here um, in the Bible itself. It's hard not to include that word in there because that's what it was. And considering that the so-called Last Supper, when Christ moved it, you know, he didn't come to do away with the Holy Days, did he? He came to fulfill them, and he did so by observing them. And he will be, as we'll read, will be observing them still in the future time in the kingdom of God. What Question. Here's a question. Will the 14th of Nisan be observed as Christ did in the kingdom of God. And will the 15th of Nisan, as in Passover, as the people of Judah call it today, or the first day of unleavened bread, will that also be observed? Well, we know the 15th will because it's a Sabbath. It's an annual Sabbath. But what about the day in which Christ was crucified, which was the 14th? The day in which the land, and yet that's not a Sabbath, as it's recorded but it's surely to be observed. It's the most important date. I mean, one of the most important dates, if not the most important date in our minds, is the day that Christ was crucified, and it's not a Sabbath. It's a preparation day. It's a preparation for our salvation. You see why that word, in my head anyway, is, is stuck there now. It's grown there now, because that's what the Bible says. And it takes a while sometimes to get beyond what other people say in order to really get to what the Bible says. I get um, actually um, <laughs> our Facebook page, my Facebook page. I say our because it's the daily Bible study. The other one, there's two of them. I it doesn't matter. I've been experimenting in the last. No matter what I post, whether something just totally mundane or something a study, which I do every day. I put the links on for those studies, or just something provocative, deliberately, knowingly, cost me Facebook friends. It will, within two hours, drop by one, two, three friends per day, even though the numbers themselves are growing because more than more come in than go out. But it doesn't matter what I post. People get mad. And it's that really sort of stung a little bit at first because we don't like to be rejected. We don't like to really lose friends, even though Facebook is something different because you, most of the people who are friends you never really met probably in most cases never will but it's 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 hard to have someone reject one for doing something that was never intended to be offensive so you ask yourself what are they offended at exactly and it's a matter of how they've been trained to think in most cases many people think in various countries around the world, think I'm unpatriotic to them. Well, how could be? I, I don't live in their country. I was not brought up with their with their training as a matter of looking at the world through their through the veil of one particular flag or another. I have one. I mean, I, I happen to be born in one country rather than another, so it's it's not something that I'm free of. Canadians they get mad at me for different reasons. But it, it's a matter of not looking through our own eyes at the Bible. And that's hard because we read it with our own eyes, don't we? It's, the, again, the analogy of the fish tank. We're, we're stuck in it. We can't help but see the Bible through our own eyes. But to at least realize that that's the mind that we have, it makes it easier to at least look at the Bible and with sort of like windshield wipers on. It, as quickly as you, the wiper goes past, more muck and, and debris and bug stuff is there right away. You have to leave the wipers on. 
and something that's more difficult, you really have to turn them on high, and even then it's not enough. To just keep a clear view on our own eyes, from our own, through our own eyes. And it's a lot of the, the reasoning, I think, that people get mad at the Bible, get mad at the truth, because they, everyone, even within a single country, people have their own eyes and they look through the different reasons, whether it be different political parties, different this, different that. Everybody's got a reason, or one lives in the north, the other lives in the south, one in the east, one in the other, whatever. It makes no difference in that how people view something, they do it always through their own eyes. And I, I sort of think thought of the, the windshield wiper analogy as well, too. Just knowing to turn it on. Because if you don't, you're not going to see anything, then, then the stuff that you've allowed to accumulate on what you should be able to see through. And if so much gets onto it, it actually becomes a mirror. And the Bible itself becomes a mirror and the analogies just go on. And Passover itself, you know, the, the, the traditions of men, even within the Church of God, I, I've been making people mad at the Church of God too recently because I, I not because I, I have a problem with so-called church government, even though I do, big one, but because I've seen the people and I hear from the people who have been hurt by it. That's my problem with it. I've seen firsthand how it hurts people. Those who who are who are behaving in that particular way, which Christ said don't do, they don't see it because those people either leave or they're put out. So that's the end of it. They never see them again. They don't see the damage that they're doing to people. Whereas here we do, or I do, or at least hear from. And it's a consistent story over and over and over again. And as a matter of of being finding where the problem is, all you have to do again is look to the Word of God and see it and understand it. And it's that reasoning when people ask, how do we observe Passover? There's all kinds of church various groups that have their way of doing it. But how many, I wonder, actually read what Christ did? Because it's really very simple. And we'll read it right here from Matthew, just to answer that question. Just a little lead into the point. Again, how the preparation was there. And how there isn't two separate days, unless you happen to be someone who isn't called yet, in which Passover doesn't apply to you anyway. People who think who, who only observe Passover or their, in particular their Easter, and have never heard of the days of Passover, it's like saying, you know, do you observe the days of Easter? Which is ridiculous, because, but that's the point. To them it's a single day, and that's it, it's over. And for a lot of Christian professing people, Passover or Easter, it's a single day. Christ was their sacrifice, and that's it. But they're observing, they are very much ignoring, or are yet unaware of, the very fact that Christ, what Christ did, that sacrifice, as ultimate great as it was, was the preparation for the offer that he was about to make for salvation, for making people free of the penalty of death. It was what he had to do to prepare the way for our salvation. And you can read the Bible, and there it is. But just read it here, Matthew 26, 17 to 30. And right away, look what happens. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover? So right away, wow, we got a lot of questions there right away. But it's the terminology, because we know if we read everything, we can understand what they're doing. And it is the preparation. He's talking about the 14th. But they call it here, the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and then to prepare to eat the Passover. So did they have the unleavened bread ready? Did they make it, for example, on the day that they had to have everything else put away? Did they wait and, and do it on the work day? You know, the first day you're not to do any work, so does that include baking bread? Well, of course. So why do you don't suppose they had the unleavened bread ready on the preparation day, do you? And that's why they call it the first day the Feast of Unleavened Bread, because it was already there? Could it, be, could it be just something as simple as that? And the answer is yes. Of course it is. Verse 18, And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The Master saith, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, 
and they made ready the Passover. And again, what he did was a unique thing because the religious authorities certainly weren't. They were about to arrest him a few hours later, torture him through the night, do all the work of the crucifixion. And the high priest the next morning wanted it all done and taken care of so that he could observe Passover after sunset. It was the preparation. Verse 20, And when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve, and as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful, and began every one of them to say unto him, Lord, is it I? And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. And stop. Did Judas know enough to be judged? Sure sounds like it, because the Lord never said that about anyone else. No one else. Did he repent? Well, he felt sorry for what he did. He was horrified by seeing what he did. Contributed to. But again, what was the purpose of Judas? Was he was he an object lesson of someone who failed to fulfill Passover by repenting? Truly repenting. Not just claiming to be a follower, claiming to have repented, but to actually do it. Verse 25, Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, Thou hast said. And keeping in mind, if you want to know how to observe Passover, well, this is, this was a part of it. There was a traitor there. Verse 20, not that I'm saying you should find a traitor who brings your Passover service, but verse 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and brake it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now, that's a question. Obviously, he's going to observe it. But what's he going to be observed, as mentioned before? Is he going to be observing the 14th? Will the crucifixion be observed as commemorated? Well, of course. Was it a Sabbath? No. The Passover was. Did you see the point? And the question of whether it was wine or not, or grape juice, or all of that. It, but it's beside the point. Again, you get in traditions of men. If you want to know how Christ observed it, there it is. It's sung a hymn. The foot washing is in John, recorded there. We don't have time to read it all. Uh, but as I said, we'll put on the link, uh, the verse numbers for that for you to read. You have to read them all. But again, you're doing that anyway, aren't you? And But to understand that. But you see how the terminology, if you understand the principle of and what was done as a matter of the preparation, that you can go back all the way to Exodus. Nothing was broken here. Nothing was thrown out. There was no rebellion. There was nothing, but he was observing the preparation of that day. And plainly as it is, in fact, recorded. And why the terminology people get all confused First day of Passover, first day of unleavened bread, whether there's seven days, whether there's eight days, people with the eight day one count it in this way because that's what it says, but it's the preparation day in which unleavened bread obviously was there. They didn't wait until the day in which they were to, to do no work to do the work of baking unleavened bread. They had it the day before, so henceforth you can count eight days. And the putting away exactly when that was done and so on. But you can see there, there isn't these lines or walls, or barriers sometimes, or somehow there's a screeching stop at Passover, and then we continue on for the days of unleavened bread. It's Passover, and the preparation for Passover, and the fulfillment of Passover, and the sacrifice. Even the sacrifice of Christ is something, it's like both directions, like handshaking. He puts out his hand, and you put out your hand, and you've got a, a, an agreement. But a, hang, a single hand doesn't do it. It's the preparation. Now, if you read them all with an open mind, you can see that the way he observed it is exactly, absolutely perfect, and of course it is, but it's absolutely exactly perfect in keeping with what was always written. And we'll close by reading um, the portion from John, which includes foot washing. John's account 
of that so-called Last Supper is the longest of all of them, very detailed, and you can't read it without coming to the awareness, hopefully by now, that it's a preparation. What he was praying for, what he was telling them was coming. He was preparing them. He was providing for them everything. He was just sort of laying the ground by which they could walk, not only in darkness, but in the light. And I refer you to, for you to read that, it's John chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Lengthy, but the prayer, everything he was talking about. And he was also, he concluded with referring to believers in the end time, which is, or later time, whenever the end time is. And as we mentioned as well in earlier studies, your life is the end time. For you, it's the end time. Because everyone, many people think of the end time as the time, the generation that will be living before Christ returns. But regardless of when you lived, you're living just before Christ returns. We put the link on, but could, could Christ return tonight? Because at the moment of your death, Christ is returned. You know, from the perspective of the Apostle Paul or from Moses or all of the rest of them, it's happened, even though it hasn't, because the dead don't know that they're dead. It's, dead is just a blink. That's how long it takes from the conscious perspective. You don't know you're dead. Dead's easy. It's getting there. That's the hard part. You know, the old joke. I urge you to read, I encourage you to read John, those chapters, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. We'll just read the part here that we read in Matthew, that we just read in Matthew, but we'll read it in John because it includes the foot washing. John 13, 1 to 17. Verse 1, now before the Feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, stop. See what I mean? The preparation. There it is. Because if it's before the feast, and yet he was saying that his hour was come, then when was he crucified? Answer, the same as the time as the Passover lambs. And he was observing something in preparation for that. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and to interject there, Satan's second biggest mistake, he should have been doing everything that he possibly could to defend the Messiah. I know that sounds strange, but it would have been in the devil's best interest to protect the life of the Messiah from being sacrificed, because it was the sacrifice that rendered or mark the end of Satan's hold on this world, even though he's still on the loose. Legally, it's over for him. Verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured poureth water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know there hereafter. And we'll put the link on for the study. Their eyes were opened after the tomb did. And referring to the Holy Spirit, a greater measure. They certainly had it to have been able to follow him as much as they did. And certainly enough in Judas' case to be answerable. Verse 8. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So good old Peter, always the exuberance there, always the over the top, and so many things, why he was always, what many people think it's somehow, the teachings that were given to Peter were actually given to Peter because he was sort of sometimes a little bit too exuberant for his own good. Ultimately, it may well have got him crucified. We'll put the link on for that study. Things that he said. Verse 10, Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and ye are clean, but not all. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, You are not all clean. 
And even you can use the analogy, what he was talking about, open shoe, open toed sandals and so on. Walking through the dirty old world, you're going to get dirty. And even the analogy of that and how it, that part of the, is the putting away of sin, putting away of leaven, putting away of the, the way of the world, because we still have to walk through it. We're still in that, in that tank. We get dirty and dusty from it without becoming a part of it. It's only on the surface. Verse 12, so after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. And again, Master, Mister, that is Christ's term. It is his title. Not someone who comes along and claims to be the vicar, or someone who claims the authority. No. Verse 14, if I then your Lord and Master, or if you want to put it, if I then your Lord and Mister have washed your feet, ye also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. And you can see there, and it goes on as we said, read those entire chapters. We don't have time to do them all. But you can see there how the principle remained the same. The principle of even himself was a humble servant. The unleavenedness, if he had behaved like Satan, what would be the point of the sacrifice? There had to be the contrast, and he was the prime example of it. I mean, he could have could have acted high and mighty, quote-unquote, and have, had every right to do so. Couldn't he? But the point is, he was coming to replace someone who had behaved high and mighty, who had no right to do so, and in doing so was able to counter. It was just a matter of competing high and mighties in a world that had become a little bit backwards and upside down and inside out. It would be confusing. There had to be the point. The, the, the lack of, of leaven, the lack of puffed upness in Christ, as with everything else, was the example of that as well. Even though he didn't have to be, he did it for our sake, not for his own. He didn't have to do anything. But he lived a life for our sake. His very physical existence was for our sake, as an example of how we are to live for his sake, and for ultimately our own sakes, if we want to be his brothers and sisters in our Father's kingdom. And that we will continue in our next sermon for Nisan 15, the beginning of the Days of Unleavened Bread.